All right, welcome everybody um, to the Pacific Core Wildfire Safety Program webinar overview. I appreciate everybody taking the time to um, join us and learn a little bit about uh, what we're doing um, ahead of the season or in the season now um, around wildfire safety and mitigation. So today uh, you'll be hearing from uh, several uh, Pacific Core representatives, uh, first being Alan Barrett, our Vice President of Transmission and Distribution Operations. And then uh, secondly, Steven Vanderberg, uh, he is our manager of meteorology. And then uh, followed by myself, Drew Hansen, uh, from the public information officer uh, perspective. So with that, I'll hand it over to Alan Barrett. Thanks, Drew, and uh, good morning to everybody who's joining us. Appreciate your time. Uh, on the slide in front of you, you'll see the topics that we're going to be discussing this morning. And uh, we'll highlight the core elements of our wildfire mitigation plans. This includes activities like situational awareness, our mitigation projects for the long term, and operational response are all in the, the foundations of the wildfire mitigation plan. Then we'll take a look at uh, the activities that are being done and, and conducted before uh, fire season or right now as we go into fire season to make sure that uh, we are prepared and our system is prepared. Uh, then we'll cover our longer term mitigation projects that are underway and what to expect uh, over the next uh, coming years as that is a, a multi-year effort. And uh, then we'll uh, touch on uh, public safety power shutoffs and expectations and procedures uh, related to that. And lastly, we'll uh, cover our community outreach uh, activities. So with that, let's first uh, take a look at the service territory that is Pacific Core. Uh, so if you look on the west side, we have Pacific Power, which covers our Washington, Oregon, and California service territories, and Rocky Mountain Power on the east side, uh, serving Idaho, Wyoming, and Utah customers. So approximately 2 million customers across those six states. And this is a good place to start just for context on Pacific Corps' capability to respond to events. So obviously when you look at this map, you can see we cover a wide geographic area. And, and what this means when it comes to wildfire preparedness that if an event uh, is located you know, in a specific geographic area, we have resources spread out across these six states and we can redeploy those resources as needed to respond to any local geographic weather event, uh, wildfire being one of those, um, but also if you think major storms, uh, winter storms, um, that same capability exists. And that's what Pacific Corps can draw upon uh, to respond to any event and also part of the wildfire mitigation plan. So with that context, now let's uh, dive a, a little deeper into the details and the foundation of the wildfire mitigation plan. So on this slide and on the right, you see a little zoomed in view of Pacific Coast Service Territory. Outlined in blue is our service territory in Oregon, Utah, and California. And in those darker yellow or California, it's red, um, are the higher risk identified areas, fire high consequence areas. And I'll talk a little bit more about how that was identified. Uh, but these are the three states where there's elevated areas that uh, get a prioritized review for situational awareness and long-term mitigation. But what I wanna highlight is we do maintain situational awareness across our entire service territory. So even the states that you don't see on the screen uh, we monitor those as well and are ready to deploy as necessary the same mitigation uh, and monitoring elements that are in the, the rest of the wildfire mitigation plan. So let's talk situational awareness. And so where this starts is a risk modeling, a longer term risk modeling where we looked at our entire service territory and look back through time and look at our fire history, historical weather, underlying fuel conditions, population, we're developing a risk model that looks at not only the probability of a fire occurring, whether on our system or unrelated to our system, and the consequences of that fire starting. And when we develop that model across our service territory, that's where we identify higher risk areas than others of the consequences of a fire or the 
uh, weather patterns in that area, making that area of higher concern. And that's how we develop those fire high consequence areas or FHCA areas uh, where we have targeted and prioritized the wildfire mitigation efforts. Uh, then if you continue along to this continuum of uh, situational awareness, then you get into weather monitoring, weather forecasting, where you look at the short-term impacts of what weather is occurring in the geographical areas to understand at a granular level uh, what are the impacts to the utility system and our expansion there. And that involves uh, weather monitoring stations and deploying them not only in those FACA areas, but expanding that across our service territory to understand as the weather is dynamically changing, what is the impact to our system, and therefore what operational decisions uh, need to be made to make sure uh, risk is uh, mitigated and impacts are minimized. So once we have that situational awareness, both long-term historical impacts, short-term weather impacts, we bring that all together and we want to make sure that we're using that information and we're coordinating and collaborating with communities and public safety partners. And this is to better understand these impacts on the communities, what are their concerns, and make sure that we are sharing how we see things and the risks and that both those are taken into consideration when we have a wildfire mitigation plan. We want to make sure we're transparent with the communities we serve, taking their concerns into account. The end goal is to make sure that communities um, are kept safe at all times. So that's our situational component. Then we move into a how do we keep the system resilient? So in these areas, how do we make sure the system itself, our facilities, are ready for these types of weather events? So this includes enhanced inspection programs where we go out more frequently to make sure we patrol these areas, have eyes on the condition of our system, and if anything is found that it's being corrected on an accelerated timeline. This also includes vegetation management practices. And the enhancement here is thinking beyond just making sure we're maintaining clearances between nearby trees and our lines. That's our underlying vegetation management. But expanding it to hazard tree identification of trees that might be in our right of way or maybe even outside of our right of way where the tree has a fall-in risk that in under certain wind conditions, if the tree was to fall over, even though it's 100 feet away from our line, could impact the line and create an ignition. So it's, it's expanding our vegetation management program to help identify and remove those trees um, where possible just to mitigate that risk altogether. Then we go into our longer term mitigation strategies. And this includes things like covered conductor, where we look at you know, how can we make our, more, our system more resilient in the long term for these types of weather events. And so if you think of our overhead bare wire distribution system and where we can cover that and rebuild that with a conductor that has a cover on it, a shield on it, uh, this means that uh, as a potential say as a tree branch or something that might blow into the line during a wind event, even though that tree could have been outside of the right of way and the branch blows into the tree. As that branch hits the line, as the, the conductor is now covered, there's no spark, there's no fault event, and that tree branch just continues to fall to the ground. The line is left in the air. There's no spark, there's no potential for ignition. And so the main mitigation strategy in these high-risk areas is to rebuild the overhead line to this covered conductor. Another uh, plan element is to make sure we're responding rapidly to fault events. And what I mean by that is the replacement of relays and line reclosers. And these are devices that when they sense a fault activity are able to open up the line quickly uh, allow whatever the disturbance is to maybe that branch to fall to the ground before closing back in. And with new relays and new line reclosers, it increases the capability for those uh, to, to be more sensitive, to be able to respond to different types of events um, and, and be able to open up quicker. And that reduces the amount of energy that can go into a fault, therefore reducing the potential uh, of a fire being started. 
And an, a new, an exciting uh, new technology in, in this realm is relays that are constantly monitoring the power quality the, the, of an energized line and able to detect waveform signatures that could potentially be disturbances out on the line that haven't yet created a fault condition. Uh, and, and so that allows us to deploy field resources and uh, in certain areas based on that relay detection and find issues before they actually cause an outage or cause a fault. And so that's a very proactive approach uh, before issues are even experienced. And that technology is being um, implemented on our system as well. So all those plan elements together make up a wildfire mitigation plan across our service territory. So you get a sense of the areas that uh, are being prioritized on, but we're constantly evolving and reviewing uh, where we're deploying these tactics. Again, it's a multi-year effort. And so if this constant review of where should these be deployed and, the, and as we make that progress, just to reduce the potential and mitigate against the wildfire uh, risk. All right, so now let's move into the specific activities that are going on as we come into this year's fire season. And so we already talked about the increased inspections and vegetation management uh, that takes place as part of the wildfire mitigation plan. Uh, but what I also want to highlight uh, here is when it comes to vegetation management is a pilot piloting of a new technology uh, that is expanding our vegetation management program even more. And that's piloting the use of satellite imagery. This allows us to produce an inventory of trees that have that falling risk that I was talking about earlier. And by using the satellite imagery, by creating that inventory, now we've created a, a quality uh, quantitative uh, measurements of that risk and so that we can show that reduction in risk over time as that inventory of trees uh, is reduced. Um, it gives us a strong measurement of that risk as we move forward uh, through the years. And so that's another way we're expanding our vegetation management program and the deploying new technologies um, than we have before. I also touched on weather stations a little bit already, but what's important to highlight here is just the continued expansion of our weather station network. So whereas we started the deployment in those FHCAs, we're expanding that across our service territory so that we can get a more granular uh, information coming back across our service territory of the dynamic weather and its impacts to our, to our system. So that's expanding as well. And so, and, and Steve uh, also has a slide here coming up where we'll be talking about, you know, his, his group, but that's also an expansion of our work we brought inside a meteorologist department. And, and Steve will be talking in more detail about what that means and how that will grow our situational awareness moving forward as well. So now let me touch on uh, operational practices. So if this involves training our employees on different operating practices to help mitigate the risk of wildfire. And examples of this can be as simple as making sure we have the right equipment on our trucks um, to not driving vehicles across grass fields where a hot engine could ignite the grass. So maybe some vehicle modifications need to take place to make sure that that ignition is not possible. It, it can also include more complex response of uh, relay settings or additional patrols before closing in breakers after an outage under certain weather events. So a lot of activity is covered under operational practices, but that's just where given in fire season and under certain weather conditions, we just change the way our construction processes occur, again, just to reduce the potential of wildfire ignition. All right, so in addition to what's listed on the slide, uh, I should also touch on that we're meeting with our communities and conduct, conducting tabletop exercises with emergency management agencies and regarding what to expect uh, in wildfire season, what to expect with potential public safety power shutoff processes, what they would look like. And like I said earlier, this is uh, where we like to not only confirm 
what our processes will look like, but confirm with local communities what's it look like from their perspective. Uh, confirm the location of critical facilities for them, uh, their areas of concern before going into an event. This helps make sure we're on the same page for critical facilities like communication services, uh, emergency management locations, water supply facilities, just the, the concerns of a community to make sure that they're fully covered by our wildfire mitigation plan and our operating practices if we were to move into a public safety power shutoff de-energization event. And so to help with that collaboration with communities, we're also expanding our emergency management department. And that's to make sure that we can support this additional level of collaboration than what we've done before. And as we engage with these communities, with more meetings, more tabletop exercises, we wanted to make sure we were prepared to support that. So we're expanding our emergency management uh, resources uh, to meet that need. So in conjunction, all these items coming together is what prepares us for the 2021 uh, fire season, uh, making sure we're prepared and that our system is prepared as well. All right, so now let's look longer term mitigation, right? So what you see on this screen, on this slide, is just a zoomed in area of just one of those fire high consequence areas, uh, Glendale, in where you visually get a, a representation of the mitigation projects that I was just discussing, but where you get to see graphically laid out in an area, the sequencing of it, and how does it all come together? This is really, and we have this for all of our FHCA areas, where we can sit down with communities and show them not just, yeah, we're going to rebuild some overhead line sections to covered conductor, but specifically where and the timing that we're currently thinking that'll take place in. And so what this allows us to facilitate the conversation with the community so they can understand that it's these mitigation projects that over time allow us to reduce the impact and the scope of not only the frequency of public safety power shutoffs, but the how far reaching that PSPS could be. This allows us to start reducing that uh, footprint as we build. So on the screen here, if we, when we finish the green area and rebuild that to covered conductor, that southern portion of this PSPS area could be reduced. And then it's only the northern area that uh, would have to be de-energized in an event. So it's the same plan elements we talked about, where it's relays and reclosers and installation of weather stations and rebuilding the lines to covered conductor. But this allows us to show that over time, the sequencing and then if we were to zoom out, you would look at all these FHCA areas together and really get a sense of the priority and the sequencing of how this all comes together for wildfire mitigation. All right, so with that, I'll now turn it over to Steve Vanderberg, the manager of Pacific Corps Meteorology Department, who will cover some additional uh, aspects of our situational awareness. All right, thanks, Alan. Um, like Alan said, my name is Steven Vandenberg. I am the new uh, manager of meteorology. Um, meteorology is a new group here at Pacific Corp. Um, and I've been here since February. Prior to that, I spent 10 years uh, with San Diego Gas and Electric working on a lot of these same kinds of challenges, which is uh, better understanding the weather and the fire weather and fire environment and how that impacts our infrastructure. And we have a lot of exciting things planned here at Pacific Corp um, with regards to weather situational awareness, uh, weather forecasting, um, risk analysis, uh, those kinds of things. Um, you know, forecasters, as I think a lot of you know, use computer models as well as their own subject matter expertise to make the forecast that we all use. Um, we're going to bring that capability in-house. So what do I mean by that? Well, to really truly manage that intersection of weather and outages and fire risk across our service territory, we need very specialized, fine-tuned, high-resolution weather forecast models that are, in essence, calibrated for our service territory and for the weather of concern to provide us with that kind of forecast detail that we need 
to understand where uh, the problems may be across the service territory. For example, um, there may be a high wind event in the forecast, and there may also be at the same time a forecast of critical fire weather conditions. And that can expand across a large geographical area. Well, what we need to know is across that area, where, where are those risks intersecting our power line? Um, and that's what we're trying to do here. So we have already started those initial uh, phases to build out that capability here. We're gonna be running our own high resolution weather forecast models. And then we're going to take those models and we're going to take that, that output, that forecast and translate it into system impact. So in other words, what does a 45 mile per hour wind gust mean? That means one thing along the Oregon coast, but it means something completely different in Grants Pass. We want to understand how the forecast translates into system impacts and then communicate that to the company so that it's not just about what the weather is going to do, but what are the impacts on our system and where are those impacts going to be? And the longer the lead time that we can provide the company of those potential impacts, the more time we have to prepare to mitigate that risk. Another thing that we're going to be doing is expanding our network of weather stations. We're going to basically look for those additional gaps in coverage and fill those so that it increases our situational awareness across our system so that we know what the weather conditions are doing on a lot of these, these power lines, particularly in more remote areas where there is a lack of weather stations currently. But we're also going to leverage existing weather stations, and we're, we've already uh, embarked on a, uh, a study, if you will, of the climatology of each of these weather stations to identify what constitutes an extreme wind for any given location, because that depends on where you are, right? And that's important to understand when you're trying to understand impacts to your system. So that's something that's coming. And then on top of that, um, we're looking at or exploring ways to build websites or web pages that can pull all of this information in, not just for us here within the company to, to look over, examine, digest, and just keep broader situational awareness over our service territory, but then we're gonna make a lot of this data publicly available so that for the customer out there, wherever they may be, is they'll have a way to access not just the weather observations from the weather stations, but the, the climatology of those weather stations will be available. So you can see when you've reached a point that is unusual for that location, forecast information will be available, um, et cetera. So I think it will help uh, increase all of our situational awareness across our service territory. Uh, and then lastly, um, as we've already seen in California with these alert wildfire cameras, this network has expanded and now is expanding across our service territories. And we're beginning to use these cameras for situational awareness to both monitor the weather's impacts on the, on the surrounding environment in real time and any potential um, other hazards that may be out there, but also even just to do a quick visual assessment of the fuels. So for example, in the, the image on the right there from Cedar City, um, this was uh, a camera of you looking towards sort of pinion juniper grass and some other uh, vegetation out there where you can see the grass in, in this particular picture is not green. And so you can get a good visual sense of where maybe there's green up occurring, where grass is obscured. Uh, you know, what, what does it look like on the ground in addition to the data that you're, that you're getting, that you're pulling in, right? So, all of this is really just designed to help us um, better anticipate, prepare for, and respond to extreme weather events, whether that be a fire weather event or otherwise. Um, and that really uh, allows us to take the steps necessary to mitigate our risk um, of weather-related impacts uh, across our service territory. I think I'm handing over to Ruth, is that correct? Yep, thank you, Steve. This is Alan again. And so taking that situational awareness and now applying it as we shift to the public safety power shutoff conversation. And what you see on the slide is the escalation of decision-making when we look at our areas and we're bringing in that situational awareness, looking at the weather in these areas, 
in these in, in at the different uh, levels of all these conditions you see as it builds towards the eventual decision of a public safety power shutoff. And what's important to note when you look at this and this escalation of decision making is that it's not a mathematical formula of specific thresholds that just automatically trigger a public safety power shutoff. There are thresholds, everything Steve was talking about as far as you know, what are we looking at, what's typical weather in an area, and when what is what becomes a, an elevated concern. But that elevates it for conversation. And then we match that with the uh, boots on the ground, local information, what does it look like? Uh, Steve was just talking about the visual, the, the, what, what is the environmental conditions? What are the impacts to our system? How is our system impacting right now or, or operating right now? And it also uh, brings into consideration the local communities where we reach out to emergency services and understand their situational um, status. Uh, how do they, what conditions are they seeing right now? And what concerns do they have? That all comes into the decision making of a public safety power shutoff. And uh, so just to, again, recognize that it's not a mathematical formula, it's not a hard cast uh, threshold that is reached, that just elevates it through this decision making process. But a lot of other conditions and considerations are evaluated before we get to a public safety power shutoff. So now I'm going to turn it over to Drew Hansen, our public information officer, who's going to cover some of the notification aspects of a public safety power shout off and customer outreach. Yeah, thank you for that, Alan. Uh, and before I dive into this, I just want to uh, point out to folks that we, we definitely uh, will have some questions and answers at the end of this. So please do use the Q&A function and submit those, and we're happy to get to those uh, here once we conclude this presentation. So. Um, as Alan uh, mentioned, that if we reach a public safety power shutoff, which we view as a measure of last resort, uh, we definitely have a robust communication and outreach um, a chain uh, put into that program. And so between the 72 and 48 hour mark before we would uh, initiate a potential public safety power shutoff, or if we're, our, our meteorology team is seeing weather conditions that might necessitate one, our uh, in-house emergency management staff are reaching out to their contacts in whatever area um, might be impacted by a PSPS. So giving them the heads up that, hey, um, there, there is some weather that is um, that we're, we're looking at, which may necessitate a PSPS um, so that they can prepare on their end um, while we are still uh, preparing on our, our on our end. And then as it nears, um, as the forecast uh, solidifies a little bit more, uh, around the 48 hour mark, so two days before actually de-energizing any lines, um, is the ultimate goal to give that first touch point to our customers so that they can be prepared ahead of any uh, power shutoff. And that's kind of the unique thing with a PSPS is that this is an outage that we can predict and that um, we have um, kind of awareness of so that we can prepare. Um, and it is always important that year round, uh, you, you, we have uh, preparedness plans that we have outage kits uh, ready, uh, just as you would for a winter storm, but it's become a, a, a year-round ne necessity. So now with that 48-hour mark, um, our customers uh, are working with the same information. We'll be able to communicate the uh, the who, what, when, and where of the PSPS, so what area might potentially be impacted, uh, the number of customers uh, might be affected by this, uh, the estimated duration of how long the potential PSPS might last, um, and then uh, yeah, yeah, just what to expect um, along duration and uh, where and the location. And then as it continues forward, we'll do another touch point at 24 hours. Even if there's nothing to update, we'll reiterate the same information. Um, and the channels that we're using on this are um, phone calls, so automated phone calls to our customers or email and text message, depending on the preferences that they've checked on their account. We're also sending out uh, press releases to the news media uh, with the same information. And then we're updating uh, Pacific Corps, uh, either the Rocky Mountain Power or the Pacific Power social media um, channels and our website. Um, but the goal is always to alert our customers first um, and then do the public not notification um, after that, very soon after that. Um, so that we're really utilizing every channel that's available um, for us to communicate this out. 
And then in addition to that, um, we're, we're providing the same messaging to our emergency management partners um, at the local and county level. Uh, we're also um, providing it to uh, critical customer lists, which would include uh, telecommunications and hospitals and others so that they're working from the same information. Because we all know that in times like this, communication is key. So just making sure that the, the message is clear and that it's the same and that everybody's working from the same, um, the same information. So then um, at this mark two, as we continue towards a PSPS, we would also do outreach around the two hour mark, uh, letting folks know that, hey, this is going to happen. This is imminent. Uh, power is going to be shut off at this time in this area and will impact this many individuals. And this is the duration of the, of the forecast that we're working, working off of, how long we can anticipate um, that PSPS would last. Um, and then at one hour, do a similar message. And then once the event begins, uh, we'll um, notify everybody that we have de-energized. And then um, towards our during during uh, the actual PSPS, we'll put out additional communications, just uh, alerting media and on our social media uh, posts uh, where we are in restoration efforts. You know, if there was any damage to our system, how long that damage is going to take to restore as um, restore power as our crews are patrolling lines. And then once we uh, have a very clear idea of when power is going to be coming back on, we'll communicate that. And then a final message letting everybody know that the event has concluded. And all that to say, so preparedness is key uh, in any situation here, um, but also with um, our customers who rely on uh, electricity for medical needs. Um, you know, it's very important that they self-identify uh, with us or their utility, letting us know uh, that they do have medical needs in their home that are dependent on electricity. Uh, we will provide additional touch points and outreach during a PSPS. Um, and then in addition to that, um, it's really important for those individuals to work with their medical providers um, to ensure that they have appropriate backup generation for their devices um, and, as always, have a plan in place. So that's the, uh, the kind of uh, timeline for PSPS notifications. But that's leading up to event. Uh, year round, uh, we are uh, communicating around both outage safety and then wildfire safety from the perspective of what the utility is doing and then also um, how customers can uh, prepare ahead of any wildfire season. And so we're doing that through um, many different avenues, uh, advertising uh, through print, radio, digital, and social. I know a number of you um, uh, would probably found out about this uh, webinar uh, via some of the advertising we were doing on social media. And then also we're running a bill message um, to all of our customers that um, you know, uh, reinforces the, the need for wildfire safety, um, but then also um, uh, uh, compelling or asking individuals to update their contact information with us. So if we do have to reach them um, for a PSPS that we have the, the best and latest uh, contact info to get the word out. And of course, this webinar, and then we have a number of informational sheets and flyers and brochures on this topic, both uh, about PSPS and about uh, general wildfire safety. And then uh, we also have a resource center on our website. And I think we have a little bit more of that on the next slide. Yeah. So on our website, we have a couple uh, different landing pages for this topic. Um, you can go to pacificpower.net or rockymountainpower.net and then forward slash wildfire safety or forward slash PSPS. And um, on the wildfire safety page, there's some general information around safety and preparedness, both from what the utility is doing and what uh, customers can do to prepare for an outage or um, you know build defensible space, um, put together emergency kits, all that stuff. So a really um, a good um, resource center on the website. But then also on that PSPS page, uh, we have a map on there. So uh, customers can go on there, input a address, and it, you can see if your uh, home or business is located within a potential PSPS zone. Um, and then if we're nearing a, a potential public safety power shutoff, there are some polygons on that map that will update um, yellow for, hey, this area is in a watch, and then red for a PSPS is imminent or active at that point. So it's a place to kind of get a line of sight of uh, what we're thinking as a utility or um, as we're approaching a potential event. And then below that map is also a weather forecasting table, which provides similar information, um, but, you know, broken down by area. Here on the slide, you'll see that's uh, some of our Utah uh, PSPS areas. And they're all showing normal, but it's a seven-day forecast. So as we near a potential event, that would switch to watch or event um, so that, again, our customers and um, uh, web users know kind of what we're going towards. So 
that kind of kind of brings us to the end of the webinar. I appreciate everybody listening in, and it looks like we do have a few questions that have come in. Um, so the first one here is specific to GIS layers, um, and if that's something that we can provide um, to, it looks like uh, emergency managers. That's a, a great question, uh, Drew, and I appreciate uh, that being asked of us. As we increase our collaboration with different, you know, public safety partners, that's definitely been a request. And what we've been doing is meet with uh, the different agencies and try to figure out how to exchange that information. So yes, we can provide GIS information. It's about finding out what's the right and appropriate level of detail to make sure it's maintained and kept up to date. Uh, but shape files, as far as areas of concern and PSPS areas, yes, we're looking to partner and figure out the best way to share that information. And it's really making sure it, it is kept up to date. That, that's what we want to make sure is done. We can definitely provide it, but we want to make sure it's maintained. Okay, very good. Thank you for that, Alan. And, um, you know, it looks like maps are the, uh, the top questions here. Um, so the next one would be, we, we shared that construction timeline uh, with Glendale, I show Glendale. Is that a, a, another uh, resource that we could share publicly or how, how are we using those? Yeah, that's a great question as well. And so what we're looking to do is um, provide those on the resource pages that Drew was talking about so that people can find on our website, you know, as part of all the uh, additional information, would be the projects that are ongoing across the years, those files so that they're accessible and available to people. So we'll be looking to get those posted. Uh, in the meantime, if there is a, a community or an emergency, an agency that would find some of that useful, yes, they can reach out to us as well and start that conversation and, and we can make sure they can get it. Okay, very good. Well, those seem to be the, the two topics, uh, two questions that are being asked at this moment. I'm going to give it another minute. I know we are already over time, but we're happy to kind of hang out and uh, answer any questions that come in. I will just reiterate from the uh, the public information standpoint, you know, we are working very closely with our emergency management partners out there in the, uh, the counties and cities that we serve. Um, but going back to communication being key during any event, I uh, just want to reinforce to our customers, uh, log into your account, check your um, contact information and all the different ways that uh, we would be able to get a hold of you. Um, just make sure it's up to date with, uh, with us. And then too, uh, there are ways if you do have medical needs that are dependent on electricity in your house uh, to self-identify with the utility um, and then also to always have a plan. So. Okay, we'll give it a, another minute here. See if anything else comes in. So while we're waiting, the question I get asked um, when I describe the wildfire mitigation plan is about undergrounding lines and is that a part of the wildfire mitigation plan? And that's a great question. Um, and undergrounding lines is always a consideration when we look at rebuilding a line. But when it comes to undergrounding, the cost to underground a section of line end up being you know, five to six times more than the cost of going to covered conductor. And, and they both you know, are effective in the mitigation of wildfire risk. And so it's really an economical decision, but there are cases where undergrounding does make sense and is used in place of uh, rebuilding to covered conductors. So it is in there, it is part of the wildfire mitigation plan, it is considered, uh, but it, it's a smaller portion compared to the rebuilding to covered conductor. All right, thanks for that uh, additional information on that, Alan. All right, doesn't look like there's any other questions coming in. Um, again, we appreciate everybody attending today. I hope you um, uh, got some good information out of this. This webinar is recorded, so it will be available um, on the Pacific Power and the Rocky Mountain Power websites uh, under the wildfire safety uh, section. Uh, so if you'd like to review it or share it with uh, friends, families, and colleagues, you'll be able to find it there. So again, uh, thank you all for joining us today and have a wonderful and safe weekend.